tonight desperately sifting through the rubble. <laughs> International aid and rescue workers have poured into Turkey and Syria as hope begins to fade for families with the rescue now turning to a recovery. Our David Muir is on the ground. Plus, if somebody said to me that while you're incarcerated, you have everything that you need to survive, I would say bull. We bring you the show that's about former convicts by former convicts for a very real look at the conditions they face day in and day out. And I have six Division I offers to play college football. How old are you? 14 years of age. We go inside the South Carolina town that turns out more NFL players than any other city in America, Football City, USA. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following all that and much more, including the destruction left behind after tornadoes tore through parts of Louisiana and why the White House says it's evaluating taking action against China over that balloon incursion. We'll talk to a member of the House Foreign Affairs and Intel Committees. Our correspondents are fanned out around the world covering it all for us tonight. But we begin with the utter devastation in Turkey and Syria after what is now one of the deadliest earthquakes in decades with more than 21,000 lives lives lost. Aerial photos above Turkey show the extent of the destruction, building upon building, reduced to rubble by the 7.8 magnitude quake. In Syria, a nation already so fragile from war, the calls for humanitarian assistance are only growing louder, with white helmets working around the clock in freezing temperatures. And despite all the darkness, there are still moments of hope. A woman pulled from the debris in Turkey alive 90 hours after the earthquake struck. American rescue teams have now joined the effort in every moment counts to reach any remaining survivors. Our World News Tonight anchor David Muir leads our coverage from Turkey. Tonight, here on the ground in Turkey, the scope of the disaster is unimaginable. And we see them immediately, the rescuers who have not given up. Workers and volunteers with picks and buckets pulling away crushed cement and brick by hand. We are here in Adana City, and this used to be a 17-story residential building. You can see the search and rescue teams are still here. This is the fourth day of searching for any possible survivors here. They tell us that they have pulled a number of people out alive, but they know the window of opportunity uh, is closing here. And every so often we have, we have witnessed these moments when suddenly everything stops. They ask for silence to hear if there's anyone still in that rubble. We witnessed their painstaking, careful work and then a heartbreaking find in the rubble. It does not get any easier. It's impossible to imagine the work that continues for these search and rescue teams, and you can see another one of these very difficult moments, uh, holding up a blanket uh, where it's believed they've discovered another body in the rubble. They carefully wrap the body of yet another loved one discovered, and then lower the body from the pile to the ground. As you can see around the corner here is the car that will take the body to the funeral home and the makeshift wards where the numbers are mounting. We are here in the middle of the night in Turkey. The families huddled in front of their own small fires to stay warm in this bitter cold and to stay close, close to the search effort, hoping beyond hope that their loved ones will somehow survive. Irdi and Rasul say they're waiting for word on their friend, a mother and her daughter who are in that rubble. They tell me it's about their mind and their heart. Your mind and your heart is here. Yes, they tell me, to honor them. We meet Zuhal and Khan, and we learn of unthinkable loss. How many loved ones did you lose inside that building? Well, 12. She tells me the psychological toll on everyone here has been overwhelming. And yet still, across this devastated region, they are finding small miracles. In Diyarbakir, Turkey, the voice of a young boy, Basir Yildiz, just six years old, trapped nearly 80 hours under the rubble. Rescuers finding him, holding his hand to calm him as they work to dig him out. He tells them his body is aching. He asks them for water. The team working for hours to get him out, wrapping him in a thermal blanket, giving him oxygen, and racing him to the hospital. 
Nearly 96 hours into this, more than 21,000 people dead. <laughs> it's been four days now since the 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit in the middle of the night, 4.17 in the morning while families were sleeping. And the breathtaking reach felt nearly 700 miles out across Turkey and into Syria. In Turkey's Hatay province, a group of rescuers on their hands and knees digging through a small opening, lifting a two-year-old boy out of the rubble, carrying him to safety. And across the border in Syria, the view from above is haunting. The smoke and dust rising. In the village of Bisnaya, rescue teams have been working around the clock on top of the smoldering rubble. In the village of Meles, the Syrian white helmets, the rescuers, and their remarkable find. Threading their camera through the rubble, searching for a brother and sister, inch by inch, until they see a hand reach out. The brother in his red shirt. The team working to hold back the rubble to dig him out. Cheers as the boy is freed. His sister is brought out too. Receiving oxygen and first aid. And the world now following the story of that newborn baby, born in the rubble in Syria. Her mother did not survive. Tonight, the hospital says the baby is doing well, and she now has a name, Aya, meaning miracle in Arabic. While back here in Turkey tonight, they are still hoping for a miracle. As we stand here amid the small fires keeping loved ones warm, we witness one of those urgent calls for silence. You can see that they have just asked for silence here. Everything has come to a halt with the hope that there'll be some sort of a discovery of somebody still alive in the rubble. That silence so eerie and painful, and we too are certainly hoping that there are still perhaps some more miracles out there. World News Tonight anchor David Muir joins us now from Turkey. Turkey, uh, David, you got a chance to spend so much time uh, with people on the ground there in Turkey. Uh, I'm curious just what has, has struck you most uh, from your time so far? Well, you know, Lindsay, so so many of the things move you from the moment you, you set ground here. Uh, I set foot on the ground as we walk around this neighborhood. Uh, first of all, if you just look over my shoulder, you can see those are the rescue teams uh, 96 hours into this, you know, a full four days later now, about to enter into our fifth day of uh, search and rescue efforts of us witnessing what's playing out here. Uh, and you can see they're still hard at work. and. Uh, as you just saw in that report, there are still those moments of silence when they call for an all sort of halt, that everyone stopped talking. There is still hope here that, that somehow they're going to be able to find someone alive in this rubble here behind us. Uh, and, and you can see why there is that hope, because in communities throughout this region, and this is so widespread across Turkey and across the border, of course, uh, into Syria, but they have still been able to find uh, people alive, including that little boy who was breathing uh, and, and telling the rescuers as they held his hand to calm him down, Lindsay, that his body ached and could they please get him some water, which of course they did as they braced the rubble to then get him out and his sister too. It was really something. Just such powerful reporting there on the ground. David Muir in Turkey for us. Thanks so much, David. Across the quake disaster zone, there is brutal cold with hundreds of thousands now homeless. Our team traveled to one of the hardest hit areas of Turkey, where chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel was on the scene the moment rescuers pulled a man and his elderly mother alive from the rubble. Here's Ian. Tonight, the hope amidst the rubble of one of the hardest hit towns in the earthquake zone, Antakya. It used to be a vibrant border town, but today, it's like the set of a disaster movie, with thousands of people buried beneath their homes. <laughs> Almost every single house in this neighbourhood has been totally destroyed. There have been a lot of people coming up to us and complaining about the lack of government help. But as you can see, the scale of need here is overwhelming. What began as a rescue operation is now more about recovery. More than three days since the quake struck, the chances of finding anyone alive now remote. But today, we witnessed just that. The crowd suddenly surging forward. Rescuers think they've found someone alive more than 80 hours after the quake struck. It's highly dangerous work amid continuing aftershocks. 
Volunteers coming to the rescue, helping to clear pail loads of rubble away. At times, silence is called as workers try to listen for sounds of life. Genghis and Ainur have just been told it's their family who are being rescued. Did you ever lose hope? <laughs> Genghis said they had lost hope, but he thanks God that they're still alive. And finally, the moment everyone in Antakya now prays for, their loved ones being rescued and brought to safety. First came 50-year-old Mehmet. These moments are becoming increasingly rare and increasingly remarkable. More than three days after they were buried, seemingly alive, a mother and a son rescued alive from under the rubble. And minutes later, Mehmet's elderly mum, Samiha, also brought out. There won't be many more moments like this. But for now, the hope that drives this rescue mission is still alive. So much elation for those moments, rare as they may be. Uh, Ian Panel joins us now from Turkey. Ian, we're now several days into the aftermath of this devastating quake. How are people on the ground there feeling about the emergency response? Yeah, I think it's fair to describe it as a mood of discontent. I mean, it's not quite anger, but almost uh, people want to come up to you and express their concern about the lack of support. You know, many people, especially in a place like this, will say, look, we're trying to do the rescue on our own. You can see the structure behind me, multiple buildings collapse, and we're here at the moment, it's almost three o'clock in the morning, and people are still out, still trying to recover, still trying to rescue people who may be still alive under the the rubble as we saw today incredibly even three days later there are still people down there waiting to be rescued now we are seeing more aid flooding into the area more support we're seeing some military lots of police lots of ambulances there are certainly lots of mechanical diggers like the one uh, behind me but i think a lot of people feel that it's too little too late and there are many reasons for that one of the main ones is that most turkish uh, citizens who are of taxpaying age have to pay an earthquake tax this was instituted after uh, the last larger earthquake in the 1990s uh, and last year alone for example a billion dollars was put into that fund i think many people are saying what was it for it was for moments like this it was for rescue it was for support it was for aid and a fourth night now temperatures are absolutely freezing and people around here are living out under the stars once more lindsay oh just so heart-wrenching ian panel our thanks to you Next tonight, new details about the Chinese spy balloon, the technology it had on board, and the White House is coming under fire on Capitol Hill for not stopping it sooner. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has our report from Capitol Hill. Tonight, the search for that all-important payload from the Chinese spy balloon intensifying, a Navy hovercraft cutting through the Atlantic. Navy divers who specialize in handling explosives looking for possibly dangerous debris. The FBI examining every scrap recovered, but conceding that much of the evidence remains on the ocean floor. The administration today saying there is no doubt the balloon's equipment was for intelligent surveillance and not what you you'd find on a weather balloon, as the Chinese have claimed. On Capitol Hill, Pentagon officials grilled about why it wasn't shot down when it first crossed into U.S. airspace over Alaska. As an Alaskan, I am so angry. To me, the clear message to China is we got free range in Alaska. Both of Montana's senators saying the balloon should never have made it to their state. I don't want a damn balloon going across the United States uh, when we potentially could have taken it down over the Aleutian Islands. But military commanders did not deem the balloon to be a hostile, imminent threat when it was over Alaska. The Pentagon insists shooting it down over those icy waters would have made it too hard to recover debris and with it crucial intelligence. Shooting it down over land, they say, it would have endangered lives. The recommendation was made to shoot the balloon down over an area that minimized the risk to U.S. citizens. But Montana's other senator argues that wouldn't have been an issue in his state. The greatest risk would have been hitting a cow, a prairie dog, or an antelope. The suggestion there that the risk just wasn't that great. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, even though they haven't recovered the payload from the balloon just yet, have they already reached some conclusions from while they were tracking it? 
Uh, they have, Lindsay. The State Department saying tonight that the balloon was capable of high-resolution surveillance and intercepting communications. But officials say military bases and nuclear missile sites took steps to protect sensi sensitive information as the balloon was flying over, and they are confident that none was collected. Lindsay? All right, Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. We're now joined by Representative Mike Waltz. He's on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Armed Services Committee and was among the members of Congress briefed on the latest intelligence about the spy balloon today. Representative, thanks so much for joining us. Sure, good to be with you, thanks. I just want to start out by asking you about a tweet that you shared this week. You, you tweeted, we've heard more spin from the White House about this and other potential balloons that have entered our airspace than facts. There are a lot of questions left unanswered. Were you satisfied with the answers that you received today? You know, some things are becoming more clear uh, and, and some things we still need answers to. I think, um, you know, there is uh, a growing kind of consensus that it is a, obviously a good thing to be able to pull this balloon and its infrastructure out of the ocean and reconstruct it and understand its capabilities and what it was able to collect. Uh, where I don't think there is consensus or even a good understanding is why it wasn't shot down in the Pacific Ocean rather than the Atlantic Ocean and the risk calculus. Look, I understand I would never want anyone to be harmed on the ground, uh, but weighing that against what this thing was able to extract uh, in terms of our nuclear capabilities, our missile fields, uh, our strategic command that commands and controls uh, our nuclear missiles. So uh, from your understanding, there was clearly a window uh, where it could have been shot down over the Pacific Ocean. And, and really a two-part question, because I'm also, we've heard from some officials who have said that there was a benefit, that they were able to glean certain information by being able to observe it uh, for a few days. You, do you feel like that's... Oh, right. And, no, and, and, and I certainly understand that thinking, but that has to get weighed against what were the Chinese able to now gather uh, and understand and transmit back to Beijing. And I don't know how you could have known that on the front end, that what we were able to gather was greater than what, what they were. But I think at the end of the day, you also have to factor in that this is our sovereign airspace. Uh, it's about sending a message uh, and it's about sending, um, you know, a, a really a, from a strategic communication standpoint, a message of strength uh, that, the United States is not to be trifled with and that you won't be able to get away with it, so therefore don't try. In the briefing that you received today, were you able to ascertain any further understanding about China's interests? Well, look, I think this is part of a, a tsunami of Chinese spying. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this is a bit of a Sputnik moment in the sense of just as back in the 1950s when the Soviets beat us to space and put the first satellite in space. It was a real wake-up call uh, for the country then. I hope that this is a wake-up call uh, for the country now, uh, that the Chinese are looking to supplant us as a global superpower. Uh, just today, the Australian government announced it's examining Chinese-made surveillance cameras used in their Defense Department. Of course, the UK took similar steps last fall. Are issues like that a, a game-changer for the U.S. relationship with China? I think so. I think, you know, we have never faced an adversary with an economy uh, as large as ours uh, with that has created such dependencies. Look, the Chinese Communist Party could turn off our pharmaceutical supply tomorrow. Uh, we're talking about moving towards a green economy. The Chinese control 90 percent of the global uh, solar panel and battery market and could turn those supply chains off if they chose to as well. Are you planning to introduce any legislation in light of these concerns? Well, you know, sitting on the Armed Services and the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, uh, we also have uh, the House Republicans have created a bipartisan uh, China Select Committee to look at all of these different aspects. Uh, the fact that we have billions pouring into the Beijing stock market and right into their defense industry, that we're then having to spend billions to compete with militarily uh, is a real issue. So we'll have a whole series of, of legislative uh, steps forward. Uh, those are the kinds of things we'll be seeking to deal with. Representative Mike Waltz, we so appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and join the show tonight. All right. Thank you.
new developments now in the Rust case out of New Mexico, where the parents and sister of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer who was killed in the onset shooting, filed a new lawsuit against actor Alec Baldwin. In a news conference earlier today, Gloria Allred announced that the lawsuit was filed in Los Angeles County Superior Court. It alleges the defendants caused emotional distress, negligence, and loss of consortium in Hutchins' death. Last month, I had a chance to speak with Santa Fe District Attorney about the environment that led up to that shooting. Here's what she had to say. Why did you believe and ultimately decide that you had a strong enough case to bring charges against uh, both Hannah and Alec? This set was really unsafe. It was not being run well. They were not doing the things that they should have been doing in order to have a safety conscious and, and certainly with guns, a gun conscious movie set. Alec Baldwin has yet to comment on the most recent filing. A congressman now to the was... breaking news out of Washington tonight, where sources tell ABC News former Vice President Mike Pence has been subpoenaed by the special counsel overseeing two probes into former President Donald Trump. Let's bring in ABC News Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, what do we know about the subpoena? Well, the special counsel Smith has been investigating both former president's alleged mishandling of classified information and his efforts to oversee the overturn the 2020 election. Vice President Pence has faced enormous pressure to throw out the electoral votes on January 6th, and he later had to run for his life as Trump's supporters swarmed the Capitol. Smith was appointed last November to oversee the probes. He's been negotiating for months with Pence's team, and tonight, word of that subpoena. It's not immediately clear what information the special counsel is seeking. And no response yet from the former vice president, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas in Washington for us. Thanks so much, Pierre. Bye. A congresswoman was attacked in the elevator of her Washington, D.C. apartment building this morning. Representative Angie Craig of Minnesota suffered bruising after she was choked and punched in the chin area. Craig fended the attacker off by pouring hot coffee on him. He escaped before officers could arrest him. D.C. police told ABC that the attack is under active investigation and does not appear to be politically motivated. Recently elected Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania has been hospitalized in D.C. overnight after feeling lightheaded. Fetterman, who was elected in November, suffered a stroke during his campaign due to a heart condition. According to staff, doctors have run initial tests but did not see signs of stroke and say he's in good spirits. When we come back, coming up, the successful SpaceX test that's clearing the way for a full launch. But next, the one town in America that has the most numbers of NFL players than any other. We're going to Football City, USA. People here have a motto, NFL or bust. It's kind of true. NFL or bust is like... NFL or street. We see news. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24 7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from New York, I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Only a few more days. The countdown to the Super Bowl is on. And tonight we take a close look at Football City, USA, also known as Rock Hill, South Carolina. The Friday night lights shine brightly there. The town says that it produces more NFL players per capita than anywhere else in the country. But what happens when that dream dies? Here's ABC's Michael Strahan. The Friday night lights are bright at Football City, USA. It's nothing better than Friday night lights. It's the best feeling. Friday night high school football games are an American tradition, but only one town called itself Football City, USA, Rock Hill, South Carolina. 
with a population of about 75,000 people, it said this turned out more NFL players per capita than any other city in the U.S. Tonight's high school stars could become tomorrow's next pro athletes. And that ball of muscle that we call Caleb Sims is just great unstoppable. Job. When I make a great play, I can't even describe it. DJ Barksdale to the outside, he's loose. Just a putter to beat. Barksdale gets past the putter, he's going to score. Ten, five into the end zone, touchdown. DJ Barksdale. I've been playing since I was little. I've always wanted to go somewhere like college or to the league. It's always been a big goal of mine. From just a handful of high schools here have come nearly two dozen NFL players, eight from Rock Hill High, seven from Northwestern, and seven from South Point. The odds of going pro are incredibly low. About 7% of high school football players go on to play in college. And then only one and a half percent of college players make it to the NFL. But that doesn't stop kids in Rock Hill from trying. He was covered on that play by Jazazion Currents, who they call Fat J. And Fat J is starting as a ninth grader and had pretty good coverage on that play. Yeah, you don't see many ninth graders starting at Football City USA, but he is one of them. Football is very important in my life because um, family bond, it strengthens because of football. We love the game. It brings us closer it's every, in every aspect of life. Yeah. Xavier Currents is only a freshman, but he's starting varsity on one of the best teams in Rock Hill. Coaching him from the sidelines is his dad, Jay Currents, who also played football growing up in Rock Hill. Some of the guys Jay played with in high school went on to the NFL. Derrick Ross drafted by the Cowboys, I want to say third round. That's me, 18. Sophomore, younger guy, all of them. Ben Watson's up here, number 83. Drafted in the first round by my favorite team, the New England Patriots. So, that's cool. A lot, a lot of memories in this room, man. You get to make some more of them. Now, Jay's son is one of those standout players top ranked not only in South Carolina, but the entire country. I have six Division I offers to play college football. How old are you? 14 years of age. Jazavian started playing football at just four years old. I wanted to be in the NFL. That's plan A. Uh, plan B is not mess up plan A. <laughs> nah, I'm playing. <laughs> nah, plan B is to finish college. Jay, when did you know he was good? By the time he was six, he had his first, I think, like eight touchdown season. By the time he was nine, on nine you, he had 30 touchdowns and had- In one season. And had three games, he had five touchdowns. One game, he had five touchdowns in the first quarter. We always prepared for him to get this much attention. I did. People here have a motto. NFL or bust? It's kind of true. NFL or bust is like, for me, it was NFL or streets. Yeah. You see all these guys going number one. And it's like, it's a dream that seems like reality mm -hmm. because it's happening so much. But in reality, it, it's, it's not. It's like a, a fool's goal a little bit. Jabril was one of those high school phenom players everyone said would make it to the NFL. But he didn't. How did that feel to come back here after not, you know, make it, hitting, hitting the ultimate dream of making the NFL? Oh, uh, shoot. It was hard. I mean, it was, it was depressing. I felt shame, you know what I mean? I felt like a failure. Uh, and I didn't know what was really next, so I kind of went into a dark area. Jabril eventually turned his pain into purpose. He's now a youth football coach, trying to make sure that young athletes know how to play the game and have the resilience to be okay when it ends. Hey, best believe, when we go step in that gym, your life gonna be changed too, all right? This is camp about love, all right? What you do today is gonna affect your tomorrow. 
He brings in mental health advocates and even former players to help kids think beyond the game. Who want to go to the NFL? OK. All right, this next speaker, he's from my hometown. He got a, a crazy testimony. So I'm going to introduce Ron Myers. My community, pressure, Football City, USA, had me feeling like I had to make it to the league to have worth and have value. When the jersey was ripped away from me, I felt like nothing. Nothing. I felt this big. Because as a kid, I was parented and the community loved me based on my performance. Repeat after me, say, my identity, my identity. is greater. Than my ability. Once people realize that football is 90% mental, 10% physical, they'll understand how important a mental health piece is to the football piece. Your, your mind is, is, is the most important thing you can have. So I want to tell these kids, listen, it's all in your head. Our thanks to Michael Strahan for that report. Unbelievable, just one and a half percent of the college kids make it to the NFL. For a deep dive on how a tragedy involving one former NFL player from Rock Hill changed some in his hometown, check out Impact by Nightline for the full story, streaming now on Hulu. Still ahead here on Prime, remembering the legend Burt Bacharach and his all of his hits. But next, the largest rocket in history passes its final test for launch. We take a look at SpaceX by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic, We're baby. making magic. number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
everyone. Today, SpaceX successfully pulled off its final test of the massive Starship rocket, clearing the way for permission to launch. Here's a look at the largest rocket in history by the numbers. For the first time, 33 Raptor engines were lit up, producing 16 million pounds of thrust. That's the most thrust ever produced by a rocket, compared to 7.5 million pounds of thrust for the space shuttle. The giant rocket can carry more than 100 tons of cargo and is key to NASA's plans to send astronauts back to the moon. And it can transport up to 100 people bringing Elon Musk's dream of making life multi-planetary one step closer to reality. It weighs about 5,000 tons, fully stacked and fueled and measures 30 feet wide by 390 feet tall. That's 30 feet taller than the Saturn V used in the NASA Apollo program in the 60s and 70s. The company will now analyze the results of today's test. They hope to launch the full Starship for its first orbital flight within about a month. And we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight, including the team of all female pilots preparing for their very first Super Bowl flyover and the other history-making moment coming up Sunday when two black quarterbacks face off for the very first time. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. magic. People here have a motto, NFL or bust. From just a handful of high schools here have come nearly two dozen NFL players. You got the greatest hits in NFL history. We got 45 caliber showcases here the Mr. Adams' CTE pathology was different. It was unusually severe. The entertainment has to stop. You gotta put the person first. There's a lot of pressure on kids to play in the NFL here in this town. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. This is one of the most powerful projects I've ever been involved with. I had never known Bakersfield to be a violent place. That changed pretty quickly. The highest rate of officer-involved deaths anywhere in the country. My son died in a shootout. I'm calling the cops on the cops. Who holds these people accountable? They met their match. Paul Jacobs of Livonia is facing a serious charge after police say he wrote a note and placed it in his classroom for students to find. Ten bomb-sniffing canines and dozens of police officers converged on Hazel Park at Junior High and swept the building last Thursday night at around 6.30 p.m. Once the search was complete, they gave the all clear once nothing was found. Police say they believe Jacobs placed the note in his classroom, which was found by another school employee. Police added that Jacobs didn't intend on telling anyone and the note, according to police, said the school would be blown up the next day. Hazel Park's police chief told the note was intentionally planted with a goal to have classes canceled. Police have charged the 40-year-old teacher with making an intentional threat of an act of violence against the school, employees, or students. It's a misdemeanor charge, and Jacobs can face one year in jail if convicted. 
A new CDC report finds suicides rose in 2021 to the highest in four years. More than 48,000 Americans died by suicide that year. No reasons were given, but research suggests the COVID pandemic didn't help. A Philadelphia police officer shot twice in the stomach, three suspects in custody. Police say this is the shooter being led away by officers. Two other suspects were arrested earlier. Detectives say this all started around 3.30 yesterday afternoon in West Philadelphia. Police say two officers approached the vehicle. At some point, a passenger and one of the officers got into a struggle, and the suspect shot the officer. The officer's partner fired back. Police say his partner began to render aid, and that's when the three suspects ran away. A male and a female were caught a short time later, the third suspect taken into custody last night in southwest Philadelphia on the 6800 block of Geyer Avenue. The officer got out of surgery last night and is stable. An uptick in the number of people filing for unemployment help. First-time jobless claims bucked their recent downward trend last week, rising by 13,000. In all, the Labor Department says 196,000 initial claims were filed in the week ending February 4th. For several weeks, that number has been dropping. In all, about 1.7 million Americans are receiving unemployment benefits. History will be made at the Super Bowl, not only on the field, but hundreds of miles above the stadium. Navy pilots will conduct a flyover before the start of the big game in Glendale, Arizona. For the first time in history, all of the jets will be piloted by women. How incredible. The pilots say that the Super Bowl 57 mission is a dream come true. I did not believe it. It was surreal. As a football fan, when I got the call to do the Super Bowl flyover, it's almost like a dream initially um, as somebody that loves the NFL. Well, this year's famous flyover also commemorates 50 years of women flying in the Navy. Legendary composer Burt Bacharach has died at the age of 94. His songs defined an era. They propelled singers to stardom and were used in countless soundtracks. Bacharach put together songs like Say a Little Prayer and Walk On By. Walk on. Bacharach grew up in Queens, and throughout his career, he earned eight Grammy Awards and three Oscars. We'll have that music in our heads for quite a bit now. Now to an ABC News exclusive. The wife of the California attorney who died while vacationing in Mexico shared new details about what happened that night and why she thinks he was killed. In an interview with Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman, we want to warn you, some of the images in this story are graphic. He... He, he was my rock, my everything. The wife of California public defender, Elliot Blair, breaking her silence about the mystery surrounding her husband's death in a Mexican resort last month. I still can't go in a bed. I can't, I sleep on the couch because the last time I was in a bed, I was woken up to find my husband dead. Elliot and his wife, Kimberly Williams, were celebrating their one-year wedding anniversary at Rosarito's Las Rocas Resort when Elliot was found dead in the middle of the night. When police arrived, did you ask what happened? Did they tell you what happened? Accident, suicide, gunshot wound. It was a roller coaster. Suicide. Yeah. Suicide. It's just, I mean, everything under the sun, except for what I think happened. Someone did this to him. Local authorities later concluding that Elliot drunkenly fell from the resort's low balcony seen in these photos. But his wife Kim believes something much more sinister happened. That last day together, she says they woke up late, got massages, had a margarita by the beach while watching the sunset. I just remember him telling me how beautiful I looked that night. They then grabbed dinner at a local restaurant and finally went to dance. This is the last video Kim has of Elliot. But on their way back to the resort, Kim says they were pulled over by the Rosarito Beach police who claimed they rolled through a stop sign. Elliot has always told me when we go down there to kind of not engage. He'll handle whatever needs to be said with them. Kim says the cops asked them for money. Elliot had said, had told him, we don't have the amount of cash that you want. And then the other officer came up and started talking to us, you know, where are you staying? And Elliot told them that we were staying at Las Rocas, that we were down here for vacation. She says they kept asking for money. Elliot got, kind of stood his ground, showed him his work badge and said, look, we're attorneys. We're not down here to mess around, but we're also not 
going to be taken advantage of. Did you not have the cash that they wanted? We didn't have the amount they wanted. Between the two of them, Kim says they emptied their wallets and paid the officers $160 before being let go. We were both rattled, but at the same time, we both had this feeling of, thank God they didn't do anything more to us. They drove back to Las Rocas and hung out at the lobby bar before heading back to their room. I put on my pajamas, we turned the TV on, and I got in bed, and he went to take a shower. Then I fell asleep. What's the next thing you remember? Two people in my room waking me up, a security guard and the hotel manager in my room. And they're saying, excuse me, miss, excuse me, excuse me. Is this your boyfriend down here? I ran out the front door and they're pointing over the side of our front door area to the ground. That was my Elliot down there. I just was yelling at them to call an ambulance, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. They said an ambulance came an hour ago. The family lawyer tells us Elliot viewed a video on Instagram at 12.35 a.m. And then just 15 minutes later, according to 911 calls obtained by ABC News, at 12.50 a.m., the resort called to report a person who apparently suffered a fall. 20 minutes later, paramedics arriving on the scene, concluding that Elliot Blair had no vital signs. Two days later, the Attorney General of Baja, California, stating that the amount of alcohol found in Blair's body was considerable. How many drinks do you think that Elliot had that night? Five or six drinks. 11.30 would have been the last drink at the hotel, which was a margarita. In my nine years of being with him and knowing him, I can tell you I've never seen him sloppy. I've not seen him not be able to walk and care for himself. The family believes these photos of Elliot's injuries to his arms and legs, which they requested be shared, tell a story that isn't a drunken fall. They consulted biomechanics expert Dr. Rami Hashish. There's bruising marks on the body. Uh, there's indications of potential being dragged on the front of the body. There's fractures to the back of the skull. Um, Nothing really points to the fact that it was necessarily an accident. Their lawyer that pushing need, for answers. Kim and her family need answers to, to bring closure to this so they can really start moving on from it. And Kim determined to honor Elliot's memory. Why did you decide to do this interview now? I want the world to know who my, my R. Elliot is. I want to make sure he's remembered. Our thanks to Matt for that. ABC News asked two independent forensic pathologists in both Mexico and the U.S. to look at the reports and injuries that came to different conclusions. The American pathologist said the injuries were consistent with homicide, while the Mexican pathologist believed the injuries were due to a fall. The family says the results of their own independent autopsy should be ready within five to six weeks. Our next guest certainly keeps busy as a poet, producer, and educator. Kwame Alexander is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 36 books and winner of countless literary awards. His latest children's book, American Story, addresses the issue of slavery through the voice of a teacher struggling to help her students understand its place in history. We are so happy to have you here with us in studio. How Thank are you, you, Kwame? I'm good. It's good to be here. So talk to us about how you go about tackling such a, a complex, tough, topic that kids can understand. Yeah, so my kid w was in the fourth grade and she came home one day crying. Oh. And she said her teacher had assigned them to um, promote one of the 13 colonies by creating a billboard. Oh. So she was in a group of two other, with two other kids, one of them white, one of them black. And the white girl said to the two black girls, one of you all can be my slave. Oh. And there was a big hullabaloo in the class and kids cried and the teacher took them out into the, um, hallway and had them apologize to each other. And my daughter, I, I thought, why did she have to apologize? Yeah. So we had a teacher-parent meeting, and before I could really get into what the issues were, the teacher started crying. Uh -huh. And I was really judgmental for a few moments, and then I said, you know what? She's scared. She doesn't, she's uninformed. She doesn't know how to teach this topic of slavery. So maybe there's something I can do to help her and help other teachers and parents who find this topic very difficult and challenging, rightly so, to talk about. And so I wrote this book from the vantage point of a teacher who doesn't know how to teach it. And by the end of the book, hopefully she will figure it out. And I think that that's so tough for a lot of teachers. I remember when I was growing up and, and slavery would be mentioned and all the kids in the class would immediately look at me. And it was like, you know, I don't know right. what to say. And I didn't have the language or the words or the 
the understanding. And I think that for a lot of teachers these days, especially as they're getting so much put pushback and scrutiny with regard to critical race theory sure. and now the book bans in particular in Florida, what's your reaction to that? Well, the idea is that it's, you know, we are not talking about these difficult, challenging topics like, you know, the world wars in our country or the Civil War or 9-11 or slavery because we want to harp on them, because we just want to focus on, make people feel guilty. We're talking about them so that we can understand them and acknowledge them and so we can help our kids be a lot better than we were, so we can help them imagine a better world so that they don't repeat the same mistakes we made. So, you know, I applaud the teachers and librarians who are pushing back, uh -huh. who are resisting um, and, and I think that's necessary. One of your passions is going to schools and actually reading your books and interacting with kids. What's their response often? The kids are not the problem. It's mm -hmm. the adults. Yeah. You know, the kids don't segregate the books. The kids see themselves, they see books as mirrors where they see themselves. Right. They see books as windows where they see each other. It's the parents and the adults, we come with sort of our baggage and our prejudices and we put that on them. But I think the kids are fine and I've seen that around the country, around the world when I visited students. They see an American story and their first response is, that is so sad that that happened. Mm. And I'm sorry that that happened. And what can we do to make the world a better place? I think the kids get it. And that's what's important. I think the books can help them imagine a better world. A a kids, when you're giving this kind of information, I feel like it's reminding them what really inherently they already understand, right? Because people will say the kids don't see color. I've always disagreed with that. Right. right? Kids do see color. They just don't put a value on it. It's, it's adults who, who quite often do that. But switching gears for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, you're now working on the crossover, Disney Plus, writer and executive producer. Tell us about that project. Well, that was more than a notion. Lindsay, there's nothing glamorous about Hollywood. It's real work. <laughs> I decided I wanted to be the showrunner. I wanted to be in the room with the writers. So I teamed up with Damani Johnson and Kimberly Harrison, and, and we created this amazing show that I like to say is matter-of-fact black. Mm. It's trying to change the narrative on what our story is. There's a danger as in a single narrative. And so the idea is that black people live, hope, laugh, dance, eat, sleep, smile, live, die, just like everybody else. And I think this show, you know, is about that idea of recapturing and reminding all of us here in America that, you know, black people are human beings. And it sounds simple and, and you know, real simplistic and obvious to say that, but we forget that, you know, and I, I think our narrative has to be widened in that regard. So you've already done 36 books. Now you've taken this foray into to TV. What's next for you? What's next? Wow. I mean, my mission, Lindsay, and you got a you got a kid, you know, and you know how important books are and how important words are in transforming their lives and and building confidence and triggering their voice. I think my mission is to change the world one word at a time, mm. whether it be to, through a TV show, whether it be through a book. I want to just go back to American Story, where we started, just to end here, because the illustrations in here, we got to talk about that. As soon as I got this book at home and was sharing it with my son, and it's immediately so powerful, so profound. And you were saying that these are actual real sculptures. Yeah, she's a multimedia artist. Her name is Dare Coulter. She's from Raleigh, North Carolina, and she did something really fantastic with this book. She took my story and she elevated it. She took it to another level. It's one thing to write a book, and hopefully it's a good book. It's another thing to find an illustrator who can create a whole nother story on top of this story. And she's done that with really amazing sculptures, with um, uh, multimedia art, and it's, it's, it, it's entertaining and it's informative and it's inspirational and I think ultimately the artwork is engaging and makes you want to turn the page and find out what's happening here in this book. Kwame Alexander, we thank you so much for the work that you are doing and for coming on the show. To our viewers, you can find American Story and all of Kwame's books wherever books are sold. We are just days away from the Philadelphia Eagles taking on the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and the game will make history, marking the first time two black quarterbacks will meet in the championship game. Kana Whitworth has the story on how the two star quarterbacks view this milestone and what it means for the league. The Philadelphia Eagles are going back to the Super Bowl. All eyes are on Arizona for a clash of the NFL's top two teams. And the Kansas City Chiefs have won it. 
but Super Bowl 57 is already one for the history books. With the Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes and the Eagles Jalen Hurts, it's the first Super Bowl to feature two black starting quarterbacks. I think it's something that's worthy of being noted and it is history. And a major milestone in the long history of black quarterbacks in the NFL. Longtime NFL writer Jason Reed quite actually wrote the book on the rise of the black quarterback. It's a breakthrough moment in that this had never happened before, but not surprised that it happened because this has been coming for a long time. Black quarterbacks have been involved in professional football for more than 100 years when Fritz Pollard first lined up under center. But that number remained low until the late 1960s and early 1970s. The white owners, the white executives, the white coaches, uh, they all felt that black men were just inherently inferior. And as such, they didn't want to give them an opportunity to play the most important position in the game. Then, in 1988, Williams deep for Sanders again, makes the catch at the 10, touchdown! Washington's Doug Williams became the first black quarterback to start in and win a Super Bowl. He had the Doug Williams performance in the Super Bowl. You had Warren Moon and Randall Cunningham in the early 1990s. Then in 1999, you had three black quarterbacks Donovan McNabb, Achilles Smith, and Dante Culpepper drafted in the first round. And we really see that, okay, the league just acknowledges that these guys can play. But even after Williams' breakthrough, the number of black quarterbacks to reach the big game remained low, including this Super Bowl. Just eight black quarterbacks have led their teams to a Super Bowl appearance, and so far, only three have won. Williams, Russell Wilson in 2014, and Mahomes in 2020. Thank you, Kansas City. We did it, baby! But the 2022 regular season saw a record 11 black starting quarterbacks in week one, with the season now culminating in two of them battling for the title. Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes starting the Super Bowl, that's another barrier to fall. But there are going to be so many more barriers that fall in terms of just accomplishments. Mahomes and the Chiefs are in the big game for the third time in four seasons. A win over the Eagles would make him the only black starting quarterback to win multiple Super Bowl titles. To be on the world stage and uh, have two black quarterbacks uh, starting in the Super Bowl, I think it's special. Meanwhile, Jalen Hurts has broken out in his third NFL season, looking to bring the Eagles their second Super Bowl win in team history. The next generation of quarterbacks, that that four-year-old, five-year-old kid, regardless of what someone may say or have an opinion about you, you, you can do it. You can do it too. Hertz and Mahomes both credit the black quarterbacks who came before them for inspiration. Anyone like Mike Vick, Cam, Randall Cunningham, McNabb, all of those types of guys are guys that a lot of young kids looked up to, um, a lot of them young black kids as well. And with two black starting quarterbacks in the Super Bowl, it's an opportunity to pave the way for even more. It's going to be a special moment, and I'm glad that we're here today, but how can we keep moving forward, and uh, how can we motivate kids that are, are younger that are going to follow their dreams to be a quarterback? Exciting. Our thanks to Kena for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Hour, what Southwest Airline officials are now saying about that meltdown that canceled more than 16,000 flights in December and the major Twitter outage that had some predicting the site's total breakdown and the emergency fix needed to keep it online. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. 
This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. For the second time in a week, a New Jersey council member was shot to death. Today, New Jersey Councilman Russell Heller was shot outside of the company where he works. Police say the suspect was a former employee at the same company. Investigators said that the shooting was not politically motivated and not related to the shooting death of another council member in New Jersey just last week. A massive three-alarm house fire in San Francisco left at least one resident and one firefighter injured. One home was destroyed and two others were damaged. The cause of the blaze is under investigation. And Twitter is apologizing for an outage that lasted for hours and required an emergency fix. A surge in user reports of various error messages began Wednesday afternoon and continued into the morning. It's Twitter's first major site malfunction since Elon Musk took over the company. Now to the humanitarian crisis that's unfolding in Turkey and Syria in the wake of the devastating earthquake there. American rescue teams are among the thousands of aid workers who've arrived from 75 countries. And the Turkish vice president says that more than 120 people have been pulled from the rubble alive in just the last 24 hours. But with frigid temperatures and unthinkable destruction, it's certainly a race against the clock. World News Tonight anchor David Muir reports from Turkey. Tonight, here on the ground in Turkey, the scope of the disaster is unimaginable. And we see them immediately, the rescuers who have not given up. Workers and volunteers with picks and buckets pulling away crushed cement and brick by hand. We are here in Adama City, and this used to be a 17-story residential building. You can see the search and rescue teams are still here. This is the fourth day of searching for any possible survivors here. They tell us that they have pulled a number of people out alive, but they know the window of opportunity uh, is closing here. And every so often we have, we have witnessed these moments when suddenly everything stops. They ask for silence to hear if there's anyone still in that rubble. We witnessed their painstaking, careful work and then a heartbreaking find in the rubble. It does not get any easier. It's impossible to imagine the work that continues for these search and rescue teams, and you can see another one of these very difficult moments, uh, holding up a blanket, uh, where it's believed they've discovered another body in the rubble. They carefully wrap the body of yet another loved one discovered, and then lower the body from the pile to the ground. As you can see around the corner here is the car that will take the body to the funeral home and the makeshift wards where the numbers are mounting. We are here in the middle of the night in Turkey. The families huddled in front of their own small fires to stay warm in this bitter cold and to stay close, close to the search effort, hoping beyond hope that their loved ones will somehow survive. Irdi and Rasul say they're waiting for word on their friend, a mother and her daughter who are in that rubble. They tell me it's about their mind and their heart. Your mind and your heart is here. Yes, they tell me, to honor them. We meet Zuhal and Khan, and we learn of unthinkable loss. How many loved ones did you lose inside that building? Well, 12. She tells me the psychological toll on everyone here has been overwhelming. And yet still, across this devastated region, they are finding small miracles. In Diyarbakir, Turkey, the voice of a young boy, Basir Yildiz, just six years old, trapped nearly 80 hours under the rubble, 
rescuers finding him, holding his hand to calm him as they work to dig him out. He tells them his body is aching. He asks them for water. The team working for hours to get him out, wrapping him in a thermal blanket, giving him oxygen and racing him to the hospital. Nearly 96 hours into this, more than 21,000 people dead. <laughs> it's been four days now since the 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit in the middle of the night, 4.17 in the morning while families were sleeping. And the breathtaking reach felt nearly 700 miles out across Turkey and into Syria. In Turkey's Hatay province, a group of rescuers on their hands and knees digging through a small opening, lifting a two-year-old boy out of the rubble, carrying him to safety. And across the border in Syria, the view from above is haunting. The smoke and dust rising. In the village of Bisnaya, rescue teams have been working around the clock on top of the smoldering rubble. In the village of Meles, the Syrian white helmets, the rescuers, and their remarkable find. Threading their camera through the rubble, searching for a brother and sister, inch by inch, until they see a hand reach out. The brother in his red shirt. The team working to hold back the rubble to dig him out. Cheers as the boy is freed. His sister is brought out too. Receiving oxygen and first aid. And the world now following the story of that newborn baby, born in the rubble in Syria. Her mother did not survive. Tonight, the hospital says the baby is doing well, and she now has a name, Aya, meaning miracle in Arabic. While back here in Turkey tonight, they are still hoping for a miracle. As we stand here amid the small fires keeping loved ones warm, we witness one of those urgent calls for silence. You can see that they have just asked for silence here. Everything has come to a halt with the hope that there'll be some sort of a discovery of somebody still alive in the rubble. That silence so eerie and painful. Our thanks to David. Across the quake disaster zone, there is brutal cold with hundreds of thousands now homeless. Our team traveled to one of the hardest hit areas of Turkey where our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel was on the scene at the moment rescuers managed to pull a man and his elderly mother out alive from the rubble. But unfortunately, these scenes are becoming all too rare as the days go on. Here's Ian Panel. Tonight, the hope amidst the rubble of one of the hardest hit towns in the earthquake zone, Antakya. It used to be a vibrant border town, but today it's like the set of a disaster movie, with thousands of people buried beneath their homes. Almost every single house in this neighborhood has been totally destroyed. There have been a lot of people coming up to us and complaining about the lack of government help. But as you can see, the scale of need here is overwhelming. What began as a rescue operation is now more about recovery. More than three days since the quake struck, the chances of finding anyone alive now remote. But today, we witnessed just that. The crowd suddenly surging forward. Rescuers think they've found someone alive more than 80 hours after the quake struck. It's highly dangerous work amid continuing aftershocks. Volunteers coming to the rescue, helping to clear pale loads of rubble away. At times, silence is called as workers try to listen for sounds of life. Genghis and Ainur have just been told it's their family who are being rescued. Did you ever lose hope? <laughs> Genghis said they had lost hope, but he thanks God that they're still alive. And finally, the moment everyone in Antakya now prays for, their loved ones being rescued and brought to safety. First came 50-year-old Mehmet. These moments are becoming increasingly rare and increasingly remarkable. More than three days after they were buried, seemingly alive, a mother and a son rescued alive from under the rubble. And minutes later, Mehmet's elderly mum, Samiha, also brought out. There won't be many more moments like this. But for now, the hope that drives this rescue mission is still alive. 
course, we celebrate those moments that still happen all too rarely at this point. Our thanks to Ian. Now to new details about the Chinese spy balloon, the technology that it had on board, and the White House coming under fire on Capitol Hill for not stopping it sooner. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz is on Capitol Hill with that. Tonight, the search for that all-important payload from the Chinese spy balloon intensifying, a Navy hovercraft cutting through the Atlantic. Navy divers who specialize in handling explosives looking for possibly dangerous debris. The FBI examining every scrap recovered, but conceding that much of the evidence remains on the ocean floor. The administration today saying there is no doubt the balloon's equipment was for intelligent surveillance and not what you'd find on a weather balloon, as the Chinese have claimed. On Capitol Hill, Pentagon officials grilled about why it wasn't shot down when it first crossed into U.S. airspace over Alaska. As an Alaskan, I am so angry. To me, the clear message to China is we got free range in Alaska. Both of Montana's senators saying the balloon should never have made it to their state. I don't want a damn balloon going across the United States uh, when we potentially could have taken it down over the Aleutian Islands. But military commanders did not deem the balloon to be a hostile, imminent threat when it was over Alaska. The Pentagon insists shooting it down over those icy waters would have made it too hard to recover debris and with it crucial intelligence. Shooting it down over land, they say, it would have endangered lives. The recommendation was made to shoot the balloon down over an area that minimized the risk to U.S. citizens. But Montana's other senator argues that wouldn't have been an issue in his state. The greatest risk would have been hitting a cow, a prairie dog, or an antelope. Our thanks to Martha for that. Now to the breaking news out of Washington tonight, where sources tell ABC News former Vice President Mike Pence has been subpoenaed by the special counsel overseeing two probes into former President Donald Trump. Let's bring in ABC News Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, what do we know about the subpoena? Well, the special counsel Smith has been investigating both former president's alleged mishandling of classified information and his efforts to oversee the overturn the 2020 election. Vice President Pence has faced enormous pressure to throw out the electoral votes on January 6th, and he later had to run for his life as Trump's supporters swarmed the Capitol. Smith was appointed last November to oversee the probes. He's been negotiating for months with Pence's team, and tonight, word of that subpoena. It's not immediately clear what information the special counsel is seeking. And no response yet from the former vice president, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas in Washington for us. Thanks so much, Pierre. Pleasure. Next to the war in Ukraine, as President Zelensky pleads for more help from Europe, Ukrainian forces are bracing for a major new push from Russia. Let's go to ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge in Ukraine for the latest. Yeah, Lindsay, the warning that a big Russian offensive in part of eastern Ukraine has already begun comes from a Ukrainian governor in that region. And an official here in Kiev telling us Russia is expected to ramp up attacks and mount a broader offensive in the coming days. The Kremlin pushing to capture more of eastern Ukraine ahead of the one-year anniversary of this war in two weeks' time. Ukraine desperately trying to hold Russia back as President Zelensky in Brussels today addressing the European Union received a standing ovation as he presses NATO allies for Western-made fighter jets and longer-range missiles. Lindsay? Tom, thank you. Southwest Airlines was called before the Senate Commerce Committee today over the holiday travel meltdown that led to more than 16,000 canceled flights. A top company executive acknowledged the company, quote, messed up. But the head of the pilots union said that the airline had been warned for years that the mess could have been avoided. Here's ABC's transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. Tonight, after millions were stranded in that Southwest Airlines holiday travel meltdown. I've never seen anything like this. This is absolutely crazy. We're getting a clearer picture of the chaos. ABC News obtaining messages sent to the cockpits showing how Southwest was unable to locate their crews or even who was flying their planes. One message reading, scheduling is asking to confirm who is operating this flight. Please send employee ID numbers to confirm. It's a mess down here. Today, during a Senate committee hearing, the airline's chief operating officer, Andrew Watterson, admitting they got it wrong. Let me be clear, we messed up. In hindsight, we did not have enough winter operations resiliency. Watterson apologizing for the more than 16,000 cancellations. On behalf of Southwest Airlines, I'm deeply sorry. 
The president of the Southwest Pilots Association testifying that pilots have been sounding the alarm bells for over a decade. Those who not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And Southwest has a history of repetition. Unfortunately, despite many opportunities, Southwest Airlines management did not listen to its pilots and frontline employees who saw this meltdown coming. And the COO for the airline says Southwest will be upgrading its scheduling system tomorrow, but that the real issue here is winter resiliency, and that will take a lot longer to address. Lindsay? Gio, thank you. Still to come, why Nicaragua released more than 200 political prisoners to the U.S. and the status of those still behind bars. But next, it's a show about former convicts by former convicts. We get the inside story of the nation's prison system from those who've lived it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right guys? Bring your friends. Oh wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. This is one of the most powerful projects I've ever been involved with. I had never known Bakersfield to be a violent place. That changed pretty quickly. The highest rate of officer-involved deaths anywhere in the country. My son died in a shootout. I'm calling the cops on the cops. Who holds these people accountable? They met their match. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Nicaragua released more than 200 political prisoners today. Officials denounced them as traitors and immediately deported them to the United States. U.S. officials say they were not involved in the decision to release the prisoners, but that they helped arrange the flight that brought the prisoners to Washington, D.C. The release list includes leading critics of Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega, but human rights groups say many political prisoners still remain behind bars in Nicaragua. North Korea showcased its missile production muscle in a parade marking a 75th anniversary of the founding of its army. State News broadcasted the nighttime display of more intercontinental ballistics missiles than ever before and hinted at a new solid fuel weapon. The parade also included nuclear tactical units. And Princess Kate Middleton lit up when she bumped into an old teacher during an official visit to Cornwall. She gave her prep school history teacher a big hug and reportedly told him that she now teaches her own children the things that he once taught her. There are about two million people incarcerated in this country, and their lives are the focus of a new series called Inside Story. It's a joint production between Vice News and the Marshall Project. What's different is that this is developed by people who have been behind bars, and it's intended for an audience that is still serving time now. Take a look. I worked about 35 hours a week and made about 14 cents an hour. It's not just that people on the inside aren't paid fairly. It's that more often than not, they aren't paid enough to live. If somebody said to me that while you're incarcerated, you have everything that you need to survive, I would say bull. I want to welcome to the show co-creator and host Lawrence Bartley. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. Thank you. So you report here that the average um, payment is about 52 cents an hour for an inmate. Explain to me how that really kind of 
plays a part in, in the larger problems uh, in the American uh, justice system, prison system in particular? Well, folks max out at 52 cents an hour. Some states, you don't get paid nothing at all for mm -hmm. a full day's work. And if a person is incarcerated for, let's say, 20 years and able and made to toil, um, that type of work is mandatory. You can't just say, I'm not going to work. You have to have, you have to work two modules a day in order to meet your parole requirements. So a person goes to the board 20 years later, if the person hasn't been working, a person can't get out. And to only work for 52 cents an hour where they have to eat, pay for their food, that that's not the mess hall food, because everything you heard about food in the mess hall is true, is very nasty. So folks try to buy stuff on commissary and other things to make them feel like they have some sense of humanity while on the inside and 52 cents an hour just really doesn't get it. So let's talk about your personal experience a bit. You spent 27 years behind bars for a number of crimes, including murder. How did your experience lead you to what you're doing today? Well, when I was incarcerated, I was part of uh, what's called the IOC, which is like a government for incarcerated people. We're elected just like officials are elected on mm. the outside and by block. And, and then of the nine folks who are elected, they pick a, a chairman. And I, I was that in many institutions for many years. I went in at 17. I did 27 years. So in, in that role, I was made to take on all the complaints from the incarcerated population and bring that to the prison administrators. And in that role, I, I began to learn the balance between the two, because prison administrators used to have complaints as well to bring it to us, to bring to the incarcerated population. And we should try to kind of remedy that from the middle. And I began to care about everyone, even folks that I didn't speak to, and I wanted to, I was sharing information. So naturally, when I came out, I didn't think I would fall into journalism, but naturally I fell into journalism, and I'm still sharing information with folks. You open up the first episode talking to some youth who are incarcerated in New Orleans. Why was that important for you to start that way? Well, because I myself, I was incarcerated at 17, as I just mentioned, and being, growing up in a system, learning how to shave in the system, and mm -hmm. being in a world of, of men, and in a hard place to boot, it was really tough on, on a person's psyche. Many of my peers developed mental issues. Many of my peers didn't make it. They didn't come out. Who, who went in with me as teenagers, and and I felt like I survived that. And I felt like it's up to someone like me to tell the stories that people that usually don't hear or don't think about when dealing with children. Like we like to think that we pull the curtain back on a criminal justice system. Uh, you also spend some time telling the stories, highlighting the stories of people who have found success in their lives after being incarcerated. And your goal really is that people who are behind bars are going to see this. What do you hope that they take away? Well, I'll, I like to encapsulate that in a letter I got from a, a young man. Uh, we also print a magazine called News Inside that we distribute in prisons and jails. And I got a letter from a young man who, who said, I'm 21 years old, I get out in nine months. And when I get out, I'm going to commit more crimes. I'm, I'm a career criminal. I don't have any other goals. And I know I'm going to come back. But this old timer told me, that I need to go read News Inside. Mm. So I went to the library, I got News Inside, and I read that you were 17 years old when you got in, but now you're out. You're a publisher of a national publication. And I thought that, wait, I can do something better with my life. So I did a 180, and now I'm going to go out, and I'm going to be productive, and I promise you I'm never coming back. And that's what I want people to get from Inside Story. We highlight stories of individuals who go on to be chefs, as in this episode, individuals who go on to be magicians, uh, many different careers, career paths that incarcerated people didn't think was possible for them, but we're showing them that it is. So worthwhile and meaningful what you're doing. Lawrence, thank you so much for your time and your work. We want to let our viewers know that you can watch the eight episode series Inside Story on the Vice website or at the marshallproject.com. And still to come, we're taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation, laughs, jokes, and toxic relationships. It's all in my conversation with comedic star Matt Reif next in this week's TikTok. We'll be right back. All right, here we go. You ready? Yeah. 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Comic relief is now at your fingertips, folks, and we are seeing a wave of comedians use the platform to connect with fans on a personal level. Comedian Matt Reif is doing just that with his 7.7 .7 million TikTok followers from his time on MTV's Wild Now to a role on Fresh Off the Boat. Matt is no stranger to making people laugh. Take a look. Nothing like where I'm from. It's so weird. I'm good looking. <laughs> I don't like it any more than you guys do, okay? This is not good for comedy, okay? <laughs> you are good looking, Matt. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Welcome to the show. Stop. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so from an early age, you started telling jokes. 15 years old, you opened up for comedians, mm -hmm. DeRay Davis and Dane Cook. When did you discover your, your knack for, for being funny and making people laugh? Um, I think you do a lot of self-searching during a lot of uh, in-school suspension for uh, being class clown and making my classmates laugh. I was like, maybe if, if there's a way I can make money doing this and not be in jail, then uh, I think there, there could be a fun career here. So it worked out. On Valentine's Day, you're releasing your highly anticipated stand-up special titled Matthew Stephen Reif. You dedicate this special to your grandfather. Tell us why. So my grandpa is really the reason why I got into this comedy in the first place. Uh, I would spend every weekend with him when I was a kid. He was my father figure growing up. And um, he was highly anticipating this special coming out. Uh, he hadn't been on a plane in like 30 years. So back in this past summer, when I was planning on you know shooting the special this fall, winter, uh, he was really excited to come out. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away mm. the weekend right after Thanksgiving this year. Um, so in doing that, I changed a bunch of the material. I changed the whole set for it, the title, the theme, the entire, the entire uh, idea of the special to kind of um, encapsulate how much he meant for me. And I think there's a wonderful message at the end of the special that um, calls back to a joke in the beginning of it. And, you know, it's just something I hope he's proud of. Of course. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but, but, but certainly very sentimental uh, that you're it's dedicating It's okay. He was a this. Fox News guy anyways. You uh, wouldn't like him. Okay. <laughs> But with more than 7 million followers on the app, you're one of the fastest growing comedians on the platform. TikTok is really giving comedians a, a chance to reach a wider audience with just one click. Why do you think that people are so drawn to your particular comedic style? Uh, I'm going to be completely honest. I, I don't know. I, I don't understand it any more than you do. It was it was so it's random. It's your good looks. And I, I've been doing <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I hope so. I hope it's something that I can actually control. Um, it's it's exciting, but also odd because there's so many people, so many comedians who who blow up on TikTok and then they have to learn how to do stand up. And I've been doing comedy for it'll be 12 years this April. So for me, it kind of felt like people people love to refer to me as like the comedian from TikTok, or even though like I'm I'm I just happen to be a comedian who found success in t TikTok. As we just see there, you're not afraid to push the comedic boundaries. Uh, with today's current political climate, though, I I'm curious, do you ever feel like you need to self-censor because there are many people who get canceled these days in a heartbeat? No, absolutely not. I think the world needs to laugh more now than ever. I, mean, I, I don't believe in taboo subjects. I feel like if 
if you're scared to talk about something, that's when you should talk about it the most. And I feel like you can make light of literally any situation. I don't think there's any subject matter in which you can't make a joke about as long as you yourself know it's coming from a good place. If you know you're a good, if you know you're a good person and you have good intentions and your right. intention is just to make the world laugh, then I think you're actually doing a good thing. I mean, you're, you can't please everybody the same way you wouldn't want to be friends with everybody. So you just, you know, you kind of write material. You become more of yourself the longer you do comedy. And, you know, you hope your people find you. But you're also embarking on your biggest tour yet. And what can fans expect from your shows that they won't find from your TikTok videos? Um, good, well thought out, crafted material. The majority of my TikTok is crowd work because it's one of my favorite things to do. I, I love improving. I love working with the crowd because you never know what's going to come out of that. And a lot of comedians either don't do that or can't do that. So I feel like that is a very unique part of my show. And that's why I've chosen to showcase it on TikTok. But when you come to my show, you're going to see an hour to an hour and a half long show of material that actually I created, planned out, and wrote that is honestly better than the crowd work. So if you like what's on TikTok, I really think you're going to enjoy the live show. All right. Well, Matt, we thank you so much for making us laugh today and for joining us. Tickets are now available for Matt's stand-up comedian special. Check out moment.co for more details. And you can find Matt on TikTok at Matt Rife. Thank you so much. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. We'll be right back.